Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm Ben, and this is the Epiphone inspired by Gibson Custom Shop 1963 Firebird 5. Let's go. So if you don't know anything about the wild design of the Firebird, well I can give you a super quick summed up history. It was the early 1960s and the Stratocaster was the hot thing and Gibson was like, hey, we got to get something wild out there to draw in some of these new guitar players. So then president of Gibson, which was Ted McCarty, he convinced retired world famous automobile designer Ray Dietrich to come out of retirement to come up with a wild guitar design, anything that he wanted, as long as it could compete. And I think what Ray's probably most famous for is the Checker Cab, and everybody's seen these. It was, for a long time, the quintessential New York cab. Now, he's done a ton of other automotive designs and sold them to Packard, sold them to Chrysler. He's designed custom vehicles for Herbert Hoover. I mean, he was the guy when it came to automotive designs. And so, of course, Gibson was like, hey, we got to get you in here to design a guitar. Anything you want, any wild design, doesn't matter as long as it looks cool and it sells. And pretty much what he came up with was this. Now, this is known as the Reverse Firebird. There is also a non-Reverse Firebird, which, interestingly enough, came out two years after this model in 1965. But for 1963, we get this one, which is the Firebird 5. Now, there was also a Firebird 1, a Firebird 3, a Firebird 5, and a Firebird 7. And the only difference, really, between those was the feature set that was on them. Otherwise, the body was more or less identical. And so what we've got here is a neck through design, which was Gibson's first. And to be honest with you, I don't think they really do that too often. I'm not too sure of how many other guitars they have. I mean, there's rumors that the Futura was a neck through. I'm pretty sure there was a neck through 12 string SG. I'm sure there's a few others, but they don't really do it too often. And what that basically means is this guitar is one piece from down here at the bottom, all the way up here to the tip of the neck, the headstock there. And you can see where these wings here are glued in. That's this jut that you see on the sides. Now what that's supposed to do, of course, is help out with sustain. And maybe I'm sure it affected the manufacturing process as well. I'm not sure if that made it more difficult or not. But overall, it's, it's definitely unique for Gibson. Now I have to say, I was definitely surprised that this is one of the models that Epiphone decided to release. I'm certainly welcoming of this release. I think it's one of Gibson's best guitars ever made. And I was definitely sad when they took it off the market in 2020. And basically it's reserved for just custom shop models now. But as soon as I saw the announcement for this, I was like, I gotta get my hands on that and give it a shot. So we will dive into this guitar and I'm gonna check out every aspect of it. And just for reference, I actually do have a 2019 Gibson model that I did purchase brand new. So this isn't going to be apples to apples as this is sort of designed after the 1963 model. And the 2019 Gibson is more of their modern take on the Firebird. So it's not going to be a side by side comparison, but I am going to use it from time to time just to compare certain notes or measurements or things like that. So let's get into it now. $1,700 for this guitar, which to be honest with you, I thought was a little bit crazy for an Epiphone. This makes it pretty much the most expensive Epiphone release to date outside of their USA Casino models. Now, yes, I do think that that is pretty excessive for an Epiphone, and I don't really say the prices are too expensive on my channel too often, but I do think in this case it is definitely touching on that. I'd like to know why, but maybe that's just because of the partnership with the custom shop. And you can talk to anyone out there. Some people think it's a legit partnership. Other people think it's just a title. I have no idea, but uh, yeah, that's the case. $1,700 for this. Now there is a Firebird 1 model that was released concurrently with this, and that retails for about $1,300. Now the difference between this one and that one, of course, is you get the trapezoid inlays on this model. You get the two pickups. You get a little bit different routing for the selector switch, since the other model only has one pickup. And of course, you've got the Maestro Vibrola on this model, which is not available on the single pickup model. And I think this is just about as good a time as any to talk about the different finishes available. This one is known as the Blue Frost, but there is also a version of the Firebird 5 in Ember Red, which looks pretty cool. It's not the same red as this, which is known as a Cardinal Red. It's more of a burnt red color, burnt amberish mix with red. Now the Firebird 1 model is available in completely different flavors to this, and that would be Heather Polly, Silver Mist, and the ever popular Inverness Green. I do think Inverness Green would have been a nice touch for the two pickup model, but it is what it is. 
Now moving on to the case, we start with a nice faux leather black here. Towards the bottom we see the silkscreened Epiphone slash Gibson custom logo. We open it up and we get that nice old-timey yellowish green plush interior, complete with a nice pocket for the case candy. Now when we look at the case candy here, we see the old advertisement for the Gibson app, the Epiphone warranty card, a copious amount of stickers, a toe tag explaining that there are Gibson strings on this guitar. Well, there were until I changed them anyway. And lastly, you get a key for the case. Now there's something I want to point out that surprises everyone that's never actually played a Firebird or held one or seen one, and that is basically the size of this guitar case. Now this is the Firebird case next to a Les Paul case. It is humorously big, so keep that in mind if you buy a Firebird. You're basically going to need to rent out a storage shed to store the case in. Now in the late 1950s and 60s, Gibson was pretty much throwing everything at the wall and seeing what stuck. I mean, we've got the SG, we've got the Explorer, we've got the Flying V, and of course we have the Firebird. Now fortunately for them, nearly every design did stick to the wall, and that's of course why we have all these legendary guitars now. So I was not surprised at all when I first learned that this was designed by an automotive designer, because look at it, it looks pretty much like it came out of that era, the retro futuristic look, almost like a concept car. You've got these sharp angles and chrome everywhere, like the old grills on those cars. Now the headstock, of course, looks very sleek here with these banjo style tuners. I mean, you can't even see them. And that's because they're hidden behind the headstock right there. And of course, who doesn't notice the giant etched Maestro Vibrola here right on the face? I mean, this is such an iconic design. It's been mimicked, it's been replicated, but never quite as accurately or as good as the traditional Firebird, complete with the offset knobs. I mean, in my mind, that would just be something that I wouldn't even conceive of. It would be off to, to consider like, hey, why don't we have one knob just slightly offset of all the other three? I would never do it. And I guess that's the mark of a good designer right there. Now, when it comes to the body of the Firebird and the neck by extension, well, that's something we kind of already talked about. And that is the neck through design that extends pretty much from the bottom here all the way up to the tip of the headstock. And you can see this little jut here on the sides, right here and here, and that's essentially where the two mahogany wings are glued to the centerpiece to form the rest of the body. So just what exactly is this neck through design? Well, well it's actually nine different plies. You've got five plies of mahogany connected with thin plies of walnut. And you'll see when I pop open the cavity here, you can kind of get a glimpse of what that actually looks like on the inside. It's pretty neat. Now, if we were to look at the Gibson model here, you can see very thin lines right here where the plies actually come together. But otherwise, the body is nearly a flat slab barring that jut right there. It's pretty much a 1.35 inch thickness here. And when it gets to the centerpiece here, it bumps up almost a quarter of an inch to about a 1.6 somewhere around there. The only sort of aesthetic carve in the body per se is this belly carve here on the backside, which is a nice touch. Helps it sit a little bit more comfortably, especially if you're sitting and playing. Uh, otherwise, you've got these really nice smooth edges. Nothing too sharp on it. One thing that I do really like is since it is one piece, the neck really just folds into the body there at around the 19th fret, which gives you great upper fret access. I really like that. Now we've kind of already touched on the neck by definition of talking about the body as well. Now this is an Indian laurel neck and I do have to say there's points off to Epiphone for this. I think they should have either done rosewood or even ebony, which was more of a traditional wood back in the 1960s for the Firebirds. I'm not really too sure why they went with Indian laurel, especially at this price point, and trying to match the 1963 model as much as they could. But when we move on to the measurements here, well up at the nut here we get a 1.68, which is Pretty typical for your Gibson and Epiphone line of guitars. When we move on to the first fret here, we're getting a 0.85 inches, and down here on the 12th fret, we're actually getting a 1.02. Now, Epiphone calls this the 1963 Firebird profile. You know, I've played a lot of different Firebirds from Gibson. I've played some from Epiphone. I've never played two Firebirds that had a similar neck. For example, I have to be so careful with these bodies because they, they there's no straight angle to actually lean them on something. But moving on to this Gibson here, this is a slim taper and it's noticeably different than any other slim taper necks that I have. Now the 1963 Firebird also had what was called a slim taper, but I actually find this one to be 
more closer to the 1966 Melody Maker that I reviewed a few weeks ago. And the fact that it's kind of measures like an actual slim taper here, but then once you get down to the 12th fret, it kind of molds itself into that thick C baseball bat kind of territory there. This is a better visual representation of the frets here. You've got your first fret there. You can see how it's pretty much a C shape. And then moving down to the 12th fret here, you can see it's more of a flatter C, but it's certainly wider and thicker as well. Now, when it comes to the actual radius of the fretboard here, well, I was getting kind of some interesting measurements. Technically on paper, it's a 12 inch radius. And I do get a 12 inch radius measurement around the E strings where it definitely starts to fold over. But in the middle here where the B, D, G, and A strings are, it's actually measuring close to a 15 inch or a pretty flat surface. So, you know, I know that nobody's gonna ever feel the difference there, but when it comes to the technicalities of it, that's the measurements I'm getting anyway. And when it comes to headstock angle, even though it is an Epiphone, they did decide to go with the Gibson style 17 degree neck angle back there, which I think is a nice touch. And it's definitely traditional of a Firebird to have a completely crazy neck thickness once you include these banjo tuners. I mean, I've read stories about the tuners resting on the backside of the case and the case falling and that snapping the neck. And it's, it's a thing. And now the case is like six and a half inches thick just to accommodate how wide this guitar sits when it's laying on its back. Now, speaking of the headstock, one of the things that I always loved about the traditional Firebirds, and Gibson has done this on and off, is they had this stepped headstock there where you can see it's got a little routing there, pretty much where the tuners are that sticks up compared to the rest of it. Now, my 2019 does not have that. It just has a veneer over the whole thing. And I don't think that's too sharp of a look, but this design I think is awesome. And I'm pretty happy that I finally have a Firebird that has that traditional look to it. Now, one last thing I want to point out with the neck or really emphasize that I've already talked about is the upper fret access and the fact that the neck just folds into the body there. You just have complete access all over the fretboard here, which is pretty phenomenal. Now, when it comes to the hardware, well, let's start down here at the very bottom. We've got our traditional Epiphone style flower pot strap buttons there. Never really liked those, and I don't like them on this guitar, but of course those are matched up here on the upper side with not one, but two of those. We've got one of them on what would be the upper horn here, as well as one of them centered on the back there. Now what is interesting is on the Epiphone model, it's pretty much centered with the center block here, whereas on the Gibson model, it is offset on the center block. I don't know if you can see that there, but it's pretty much in the top third of the center block and you only get one option on the back, which is centered with the neck. Now, speaking of that, you're probably only gonna use the one that's on the center unless you get some strap locks because this one is rigged to blow. If you put your strap on there and you make the wrong move, this guitar is gonna be laying on the floor in no time. Now, continuing on with the hardware, we've got this Maestro Vibrola, which is etched with the Epiphone logo as opposed to the Gibson logo, of course and that leads to your Vibrola, which they have said they've redesigned this, and you can see here that there is a nut that's sort of attached here on the backside, and that certainly helps keep the arm a little more rigid, and that's always been a problem with these, is as you turn them, they tend to self-loosen, and then they're just flopping around everywhere and really pissing you off when you're playing. So it seems like maybe they've fixed this, but only time will tell once things start to wear out a little more. Moving on from that, we've got our Epiphone ABR bridge here, which is sitting on our body sunk bushings that have a threaded pole in them and these thumb screws, so you can adjust those as needed. Now, one thing I really like about the Epiphone ABR is they didn't make it that lock tone stuff that Epiphone always does, and this is just pretty much a straight bridge complete with a wire to keep all the parts together. Now, moving up the body here, we've got these chrome pickup rings, which is a really sharp touch. You can see that they're mounted straight to the body, which was traditional for 1963. Of course, the more modern Firebirds now put a spacer in there so that the pickups can better line up with the string angle. And it doesn't really matter. That doesn't match too much. I mean, we've survived on SGs for just about as long as this guitar now, so I think it'll be okay. Now, moving just to the side of that, you've got your selector switch, which is sturdy and loud like they always are on Epiphones. Moving on to the neck, we've got our medium jumbo frets. And just above that, we've got our truss rod underneath this cover. Now this is a traditional Epiphone dual action truss rod, which does differentiate itself from the Gibson single action truss rod, of course. 
And lastly, moving to the back side of the guitar, you've got your Klusen Planetary Gear banjo style tuners. Now I've always loved these things and I've loved how it makes the headstock on the Firebird look, but I'll be the first to admit, and there's many people that will tell you this, these are definitely a form over function kind of design. They don't really function that well. I mean, these are 12 to one, as you can see here. They're also incredibly heavy, which lends this guitar to an insane amount of neck dive, which is not good things. I mean, but look at this guitar. It was always about the way it looked more than anything else. And the fact that it actually sounds good is just a cherry on top, to be honest with you. Now, moving on to the electronics of this guitar. Well, these are the Gibson Mini Humbuckers, which is interesting because Gibson acquired these when they purchased Epiphone, and they were originally known as the Epiphone New Yorker pickups. So up here we've got the neck or rhythm mini humbucker and down here we've got the lead mini humbucker as you can see here and the cavity looks pretty good there if you get a chance to look at that. Now taking measurements of these, this is almost a perfect match set and then I'm getting a 6.98 for the bridge and a 6.99 for the neck and when you combine them together you're going to get a 3.45. Now something I find interesting is on the Gibson which also claims to have Gibson mini humbuckers of course the measurements I'm getting are substantially higher, with the bridge reading a 23.88 and the neck reading a 15.55, and combined you get a 9.4. So that is substantially hotter than the Epiphone, and I'm curious what's going on there or what they did to change these around. As far as I know, they're both Alnico 5 magnet mini humbuckers, but clearly something is different. Anyway, moving back to the Epiphone, we pop the cap off the back here, and what we see is 500k CTS pots and Mallory capacitors in there. And much to my delight, you can see that this guitar sports 50s style wiring. Now what that generally means is the tone should stay the same as I adjust the volume, whereas it tends to get a little darker on more modern wiring when you turn the volume down. But conversely, what that also means is when I adjust the tone, it could have an effect on the volume. And it might not be as smooth of a rollover with 50s wiring as it is with modern wiring now. But we're gonna find out when we plug this thing in and see what it sounds like. And moving on to other materials, we've got our traditional top hat knobs here. Now one of my pet peeves is you can see these have these silver disc inlays there. And what I don't like is it would have taken somebody like an extra five seconds to line them all up so the tens are all in the same spot and so the words are all in the same spot. But they did not do that and as a result, you know, the volume 10 on the neck is here and the volume 10 on the bridge pickup is here and the tone 10 is here. and it takes two seconds to fix, but I think for $1,700, somebody should have at least lined those up. I know that's a silly pet peeve, but I bought this Gibson Firebird brand new for $1,500 four years ago, and they managed to nail that. So if I got something to complain about, I'm definitely going to complain about the discs not lining up. But let's move on to the pick guard now. We've got a three-ply white, black, white plastic pick guard complete with the Firebird logo there, which is always a nice touch. We've got our cream-colored pickup selector tip. And we've got our plastic vibrola handle here, which also completes the traditional look. Now, something that is pretty cool, though, is we've actually got Mother of Pearl inlays on this Epiphone. And I've played a lot of Epiphones. I'm not too sure of any other ones that have real Mother of Pearl that I can think of anyway off the top of my head. I'm sure there's others. So let me know in the comments. And we've got our cream binding here on the neck. Now, of course, with all Epiphone guitars, the frets are just sitting on top and the nibs are not part of it like they are on the Gibson. That would have been a nice touch, but maybe a bridge too far for the Epiphone factory in China. Moving over here to the nut, we've got a Graftec nut, which is pretty much a standard for all Gibson and Epiphones nowadays. And we've got our Epiphone truss rod cover. Now, in case you're wondering if you can throw the Gibson one on there and parade this thing around like a Gibson Firebird, well, you can't. Not quite so easily, anyway. The holes don't really quite line up, and... It's just a slightly different shape. Now I'm sure somebody out there is a brand snob and is gonna get creative and do that, but it's not as easy as just swapping one with the other. Now when it comes to the feel of this guitar, it's hard to deny just how big it is. And that's probably my single biggest deterrent when it comes to playing it, is I'm just afraid I'm gonna bang into a wall that's five feet away. And I know that sounds silly, but if I were to take measurements from the two farthest dimensions, this guitar is about six inches longer than a Les Paul or an SG or even a Fender Strat. I mean, it is just a ginormous guitar. And it has these weird body things that stick out in different places that you're not quite used to, like this horn back here. I mean, I guess if you play an Explorer, you're probably used to that, or a Flying V. But if you don't play those, this is definitely a different beast. 
and it certainly weighs it too. This thing comes in at about 9.29 pounds. The Gibson version that I have here without the banjo tuners and without the Vibrola comes in at about a pound and a half lighter at somewhere around 7.7 .7 pounds. I mean, that is pretty substantial for this guitar. I've got weight relieved Les Pauls that weigh less than this thing. So it does take some getting used to. It's big and heavy. Now, that being said, it is actually somewhat comfortable to play with the belly carve here as well as the upper fret access, which is great. Now, one thing that is interesting when you sit and play is this rear horn or whatever you want to call that does tend to get in the way of your elbow. It's not too bad. It's kind of like playing acoustic guitar with the, the bout sticking out like that. But when you stand, that's when you're going to really get to know the Firebird because it sort of has this reputation of being a neck dive monster. Like if you think the SG likes a neck dive, wait till you play one of these with the banjo tuners. It is a force to be reckoned with. So what I recommend you do is you either replace this button with a strap lock or you get what's personally my favorite, the locket strap. You make sure it's nice and thick and then you just pray to God that it's enough to keep this monster from doing this. Now I will show you the neck dive test in the next segment coming up here. And this would be the sound segment, of course, where I will plug it in, play a few things. I'll try out some different combinations of the pickups as well as the tone and volume pots. And then I think I'll also plug in the Gibson here and see what this sounds like because technically I thought these had the same pickups, but the readings are so different that I'm not really quite so sure what's going on there. Um, I will also show you the neck dive test and show you pretty much the difference between what happens with these banjo tuners versus these Grover Mini Rotomatics on here. And, and you can see it's, it's pretty substantial. Even with this metal here, I don't think it's enough to combat how much this thing wants to dive to the floor. So let's get into that.
Well, there you have it, guys. That is my review of the Epiphone inspired by Gibson Custom Shop 1963 Firebird 5. Now, I do have to say I love the sound of the mini humbuckers. Obviously, they're a bit hotter on the Gibson model here, but this is not an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. And I have to believe that these pickups are more traditionally in line with what was available back in the 60s. Now, I just love the way that it sounds. And this guitar actually plays really good, and it was built really well. I mean, from the factory, it was set up pretty good. I did have to do a few tweaks because I went to a slightly lighter gauge string and, you know, just kind of set it up for me. But I'd say... I really wasn't too bothered by how it came just out of the case there. And, and I, I do think I'd recommend it as a guitar, but I don't know. It's hard to get past that price of $1,700. I'm really curious what you guys think about it. And I just have a feeling it's not going to be something that is very popular at that price point. But uh, let me know what you think. Well, thanks for checking out my video, guys. If you liked it, please click like. If you want to subscribe, please subscribe. That also helps me make more content like this video. All right, team. Next time.